Hey there, Alan from Praise here. I'm so glad you came across this resource, however it is that you found it. Um, I do want to mention a couple of things before we get into it. First, if you're in the Springfield area and you're not a part of a local church, we would love to have you as a part of Praise. If, however, you're further away, please know that this resource is in no way intended to replace the ministries of the local church in your life. In fact, we believe that the local church is the hope of the world and will make a difference for you. And so we would hope that you would get plugged in in one right near you. Now, if you do find this resource helpful, we would love it if you would give back to Praise in order to support this and make more of these uh, sorts of things available. The way you do that, just go to praise.church. If you go to praise.church, you'll be able to find a place to be able to give back to this. May the Lord use this in your life by the power of His Holy Spirit today. We're going to jump right in, so grab your Bibles and open them up to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And what we're doing as part of this series is of vital importance with where we are right now. And I hope you understand um, how important this is for where we are as a people, for where we are as believers. Um, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven over and over and over again. Time and time again, he said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And there's a reason why he did that. Because if it was up to our five senses, the kingdom of heaven would not make sense. All right, so three people have been paying attention through this series, and all three of them are paid to be here right now. So, um... <laughs> Um, if it was up to our five senses, the kingdom of heaven would not make sense. And so Jesus says, by faith, I want you to understand that there is a kingdom that you cannot see that you are first and foremost citizens of. And if we don't grasp that, and if we don't lay hold of that, then what will happen is we will wholeheartedly lay hold of the kingdom that we can see. And we'll think that we are first and foremost citizens here. And that is ridiculously not true. And so he says, understand first that you are citizens of another, of another kingdom. And that our citizenship here and the way we um, uh, hold ourselves in this citizenship here should be a direct result and overflow out of that citizenship of that kingdom. And so he says, so here's what it's like. Time and time again, he tells us this, these stories. And so right now, we need to be reminded of those things that are vitally true so that we make sure we are plugged into the right vine. Okay, we're getting there. And online, I know you are amening like crazy too. So you just keep amening in the comments and we will just keep preaching, okay? If you stop amening in the comments, I'm going to stop preaching. I'm just going to stop. So make sure to keep amening. Um, but that's what we're doing here. And so part of what we're doing is, is reading these stories that Jesus told all those years ago that are still so vitally important for us today. So the reason why we're in Matthew chapter 18 is there, there's a story that'll hurt a little bit, and, and I'm excited about hurting a little bit today. Um, as a setup, every time I read a story, one of the parables that Jesus tells, I always look around for what, okay, who's he talking to? What's the setting? What, what's the context for the story Jesus tells? And so for this one, the best that we have is, is to back up to the beginning of Matthew chapter 18. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus gets up on a high place, and he preaches from a flat place on top of this high place, the Sermon on the Mount. Great sermon. If you want to know how to preach a sermon, read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's so good. And there he's talking to, it says, his disciples. But he's not really talking to his disciples. He's talking through his disciples to the other people who are there. It's a really interesting thing that happens there. But if that is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 18 is the Sermon on the Church. He is only talking to his disciples here. 
There's nobody else there as far as we can tell. And as he's talking to them, he's telling them about how we ought to live. How we as believers, as the church, should um, love one another. How we should get angry with one another. And how we should forgive one another. And so in the midst of that kind of sermon that he's speaking to his disciples as he's sitting with them before anybody else, Peter gets up and he has a question. Here's what Peter says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to him, and we don't know if this is kind of like pulling him aside or if this is in front of everybody. I think it's probably in front of everybody. He says, it says that Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, I'm not quite sure what this looked like, how Peter approached this, but I think I have an idea, and I think I'm right. And if you don't agree, that's okay. The Lord will reveal that to you also, is what Paul said. But I think there's a certain way that Peter comes to Jesus here. It seems like he's less making a, or asking a question and more making a statement, right? Because the, the, the leaders in Jesus' day, the teachers had already answered this question. It's pretty plain. In Amos chapter 1, uh, there's a prophetic word against the, the nations that surround Israel. And there, um, the, the Amos actually prophesies and says, okay, for, for three, you're forgiven, but the fourth time there's judgment. He's talking to Damascus and Tyre and Edom and Gaza. And he says the fourth time there's punishment. And so they took that as a, okay, so if somebody wrongs you three times in the same way, you forgive them three times. But that fourth time, that's up to you. Because, like, they've already stepped over the line. And so Peter is, like, stepping up. He's like, I'll show them. I'll double it and add one. How many times should I forgive somebody, Jesus? Seven times? And even, like, the number seven. Like, it's like he's deliberately trying to, like, tie into the holy number. You know what I'm saying? Like, because the number seven is used 600 times in the Bible. When, on the Day of Atonement, they would sprinkle blood seven times. God rested on the seventh day. The seventh day was holy because of it, named the Sabbath as a result of it. The, the number seven is the same as to speak an oath in the original language. The number seven was holy to the Jewish people. So it's kind of like Peter is the class pet, the teacher's pet, not the class pet, that's the turtle, the teacher's pet who gets up and is too big for his britches, and he's like, hey, Jesus, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Expecting Jesus to be like, Peter, you are so holy. <sighs> Blow me away, Jesus, I mean, Peter. Peter. And, like, that's what he's expecting, it seems. And everybody else is like, he's so forgiving. He's so graceful. But here's Jesus' response. No. Not seven times. But 70 times seven. Now, Matthew's the only one to tell this story. But he is not, this is not, the only place in scripture that you find those words. What's really interesting is these exact same words are used somewhere else in scripture. All the way back in Genesis chapter 4. And I want to turn there real quick because it's a really interesting story. Back in Genesis chapter 4. So go all the way to the left, back to Genesis chapter 4. There there's a story about a guy named Lamech. How many of you know all about Lamech? Okay, one, did you guys just talk about it in Sunday school class? Okay, so don't mind the Carlsons. They, they know more than, about the Bible than Jesus does. So, um, but everybody else, no, I mean, you don't talk about Lamech in Sunday school class. Nobody talks about Lamech because he's just kind of like, a, you just catch him for a moment and then he's gone, right? Lamech zips by and yet... He's known for one thing. He's known for his one-liner. You see, Lamech was the great, great, great grandson of Cain. 
So Lamech's great, great, great grandfather was the very first person in the Bible to kill somebody. He killed Abel, his brother, right? And so Lamech, as his great, great, great grandson, um, decides that he's going to pick up the family trade. <laughs> he also is going to murder somebody. But if Cain is the first one to, to kill somebody in Scripture, Lamech's the very first one to do it with style. Okay? So, because when Cain was being punished by God for that, God says, okay, fine, you're going to be a wanderer all your days. And so Lamech said, or uh, Cain says, that's too much for me, God. I, all I did was kill my brother, and you're going to make me a wanderer. Somebody will kill me, he says. And so God says, if someone does, I will pay them back seven times. Okay? So here's Lamech also apparently having killed someone, and his one-liner. Um, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 23 is where we'll start. One day, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. Here comes the one-liner. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, then the one who kills me will be punished 77 times. So the thing about Lamech is that not only does he kill somebody, but he's got the one-liner afterwards. Like, he is the perfect action hero, right? Like, he's the one who not only kills a guy, but then he says, hasta la vista, baby, right afterwards. Do you know what I'm saying? Or, do you feel lucky? Well, do you punk? Anybody remember these? <laughs> they don't do one-liners like they used to. So, like, the oldest stuff, that, or the best stuff I got is, like, from the 80s and 90s. Because they don't, they need to do that again. I would watch more movies if they had more one-liners after the bad guy gets killed. But here, he's like, listen, I killed a dude, and here's why. Because if somebody would have killed my great, 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 great granddaddy, they would have been punished seven times over. Someone messes with me, I pay them back 77 times over. Yeah, I know. It's blown, it blows me away, too. I bet you, I bet you when Lamech, if there's an explosion, I bet you he doesn't even look back at it. I bet you he just slow walks right towards the camera <laughs> while the explosion is happening. He is the real deal, Lamech is. But he says, do, do you think it's interesting that he feels like he needs to warn his wives? Don't you mess with me. <laughs> if you kill me, 75, I, I think there's probably a reason behind that. Um, but anyways... <laughs> But he feels like he needs to tell them, listen, if somebody messes with me 77 times over. Have you noticed how much humans like comeuppance? It's a great word. Comeuppance. Comeuppance. You know what comeuppance is? It's when the bad guy gets what the bad guy deserves. You know what I'm saying? Comeuppance. We even have other words for it. Schadenfreude. Joy in pain. Watching somebody else who deserves it get pain brings us joy. It's a human thing. We love comeuppance. We love it when the person who has been ringing up the bill has the check come due. It's a whole tool in storytelling. You watch a movie, and the bad guy keeps getting turned up on how bad he is. The, the badness increases, increases, increases until he gets his comeuppance. We love it as humans. In 2013, there was a lady named Justine who traveled a lot internationally. I don't know how many of you guys remember this. I do. I remember exactly when this happened. It was so interesting to me. In 2013, in December, she was traveling. She's a, she was an executive with um, a multinational corporation. She was a, a, a communications executive for them. And so she traveled a ton because it's this multinational corporation flying all over the world, most of the time first class. And so she would, like, just send out... But, 
2013 is right when The Office was coming to an end. So that kind of humor that's kind of painful slash totally inappropriate was apparently huge at the time. So 2013, she would send out these tweets that were ridiculously terrible, and she would like cultivate this online persona, okay? So like she was flying first class one time, she goes, I'm sitting in first class, and it's so terrible because there's a German that's like six feet away from me, and he has just eaten sauerkraut. It's not funny to me either, but that's the kind of stuff she would send out. So she's getting ready to fly from London to South Africa. You guys remember this? Super interesting. She's getting ready to fly, and right before she gets on the plane, she blasts out a tweet. Says, totally inappropriate statement. Here's what she says. Going to Africa, period. Hope I don't get AIDS, period. Just kidding, period. I'm white, period. Okay, so totally inappropriate, right? Terrible. Turns off her phone, gets on the plane, and flies to South Africa. While she is flying, this tweet goes viral. It becomes the number one trending thing on Twitter, and outside news organizations all around the world pick this up. While she is flying, she loses her job. She has no idea because her phone is off. Before she lands, the hotel she was planning on staying at refused to let her stay there anymore. She had no place to stay when she landed because the people in the hotel decided that they were not going to work anymore if they let this lady stay here. Her entire life was ruined. I, I'm not saying whether or not that should have happened. What I am saying is this. What was so interesting was the worldwide response of voyeurism that went along with it. Because while she was flying, Twitter accounts were set up about has just, called Has Justine Landed Yet? Everybody was watching. Legitimately, in the airport, as she landed, sh there were people standing there streaming it with their phones. Because they wanted to see the moment when Justine realized her entire life was over. Comeuppance. She lands. She turns on her phone. The very first text message was from a friend she hadn't talked to since high school who said, I am so sorry that this is happening to you. She had no idea what had happened while she was flying. Because humans love to watch people who deserve to get it, get it. So Lamech says, you want to see retribution. You ain't seen nothing yet. Someone does something to me, it's not seven times. It's 77 times. It's not an eye for an eye. It's an eye and a nose and a mouth and a hand and you and your family and all your friends too for an eye. That's what it's like. And Jesus uses those exact same words here in this parable right now. And he says the exact opposite thing. Should you forgive seven times, he says, no, 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 no. But 70 times seven, or 77 times. And then he tells a story. Here's what it says. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Right now we need to pause. Your version may say 10,000 talents. The New Living Translation is trying to put into today's terms what is something that is really very difficult to put into today's terms because we don't know exactly how much 10,000 talents was. You could base it on um, really um, you could figure out how many days work it was. And so 10,000 talents would have been 164,000 years worth of work. So while it says millions, there's a lot of people who think, and I'm one of them, that that's not good enough. 
that probably what we're talking about is billions, like seven-ish billions is what I think. Some people think as much as 70 billion. But that's not the point. It's not about the exact amount. It's kind of about this number that we cannot even comprehend because 10,000 was the largest number that could be written. A talent was the largest monetary value that could be communicated. So the point is you cannot comprehend how much money this guy owed. It's kind of like our national debt. We hear these numbers and we're like, that doesn't, what? That's a lot, right? Like our our deficit just this year, $3.3 trillion. Everybody's like, whoa, $3.3 trillion. That's a lot. But we cannot get into our mind how much $3.3 trillion is. And that's what Jesus is saying. This debt was too big for you to fathom. So he calls in this debt, and he says, pay it back. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. Aren't you glad that that's not allowed anymore? <laughs> like, whoo, that would be bad news for some of us. Like, but back then you could, man, you'd just like sell them right into slavery. If you could not pay back the debt, it was a part of the legal obligation. That's changed since then, but then he could have done that very thing. And so he says, that's it. You had your chance. You got to be put into slavery until that debt was paid off, which 164,000 years. It's a while. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. What a king. The guy doesn't even ask for the debt to be forgiven, does he? Look at what he asks for. He asks just that he would be patient with him and give him a little bit, give me till next week. And the king's like, "Mm, how about we just cancel the debt? Here's what I need you to do. Tomorrow, Call your mortgage company and say, on Sunday, pastor was preaching out of Matthew chapter 18. And there, there's this really tremendous story that I want to talk to you about. And I really think you should just go ahead and pay my debt off and see what they do. You think they're going to do that? Do you think the creditors for the United States are going to write off the $27 trillion in debt that we owe? You think China is going to be like, it's totally cool that you're not going to pay him back that 1.07 trillion that United States owns, owes China. You think that's coming? Yeah, I don't think so. That would be ridiculous. And I think even when Jesus tells this story, it's supposed to come across as ridiculous. Like I bet you at this point that that Judas chuckled. <laughs> okay, Jesus. Or looked over at Matthew and they both rolled their eyes. Oh yeah, I'll pay off a trillion, couple trillion dollars in debt. All right, Jesus, all right. Like it's supposed to be ridiculous. This would never, ever happen. But when it says the man um, fell down before, his, uh, sorry, uh, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant he, who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. So off he goes, suddenly debt-free. And the first thing he decides to do is he sees somebody who owes him a few thousand dollars is what it says. Grabs him, strangles him, says, hey, you need to pay me back right now. And his fellow servants fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. Throws him into debtor's prison. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. These other servants see it and they're like, there's something really wrong about this. This, this, What? That makes no sense. And so they go back to the king and they tell the king, hey, this is what happened. What are they looking for? Come up in. Here comes. 
I am salivating. <laughs> this is going to be so good. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Oh, slap. Slap him around a little bit, king. Your majesty. It's going to be good. Sweet, sweet taste of someone getting what they deserve. Here it comes. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Okay. So that was maybe a little bit more than I was looking for there. Some translations try to soften it, and they say that they were, he was handed over to the, to the um, prison keepers. But it's very clearly torturers. Handed over to the torturers until he could repay his debt. Tell me, how do you repay your debt when you're being tortured? You don't. He is being handed over to the torturers forever. Okay, so that's a little more than I was hoping for, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, slap him around a little bit. I get that. And maybe play a really good guilt trip on him, Jesus. Make him feel really, really bad, Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, make him sell one of his kids into slavery, Jesus. Or at the very least, make him sweat it, Jesus. But torture him until he pays off 164,000 years worth of labor? That's a little much. And as if that's not enough, Jesus then takes it three steps too far. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Wait, what? You mean that comeuppance that I wanted so bad was mine? You mean the thing that I was so eager for, see somebody get what they deserve, was me. Jesus is talking to his disciples here. He's talking to the church. And he says to them, if you don't forgive, this is what it's like for you. God ties together his forgiveness of us to our forgiveness of others. And I think we like water that down sometimes, but this was something that every time I read it or every time a pastor would preach on it, like it always created dissonance in my heart. Like, wait a second. So if I forgive other people, then you'll forgive me. Is that what you're saying, God? And is, if that's what you're saying, are you saying that somehow I earn forgiveness by forgiving other people? Because that's kind of what it comes down to, right? And this is a huge issue. Because this is salvation we're talking about here. Like there's two ways this could go. One is forgiveness and one is torturers. So we really, 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 really better get this right. And Jesus says, if you do not forgive your brothers and sisters, this is what God will do to you. And this isn't the only time he says this. All the way back in that Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, he says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, the Father will not forgive your sins. What do we do with that? Because that sounds an awful lot like we earn God's forgiveness of us by forgiving other people. But it can't be that. Because Galatians chapter 2 verse 8 very clearly tells us that it is not 
our doing. It is all his grace to us. It is his tremendous gift to us. We can't take credit for it. We can't boast over it. It's not about what we have done, but about what he has done. So what in the world? How do we take this? And if the disciples didn't really catch it back on the Sermon on the Mount, if they maybe would have just brushed over it, okay, he's talking to those guys behind us. Here they can't do that because he's talking right to them. And at this point, we need to understand what is happening in this parable because it is of vital importance to us. Jesus says, this is what your heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So we really better understand this parable. So let me give you three things I notice here. Three things that kind of grab my attention from this parable. Three things that as I've sat with it for a while and sat with Christ in this for a while that have kind of popped up for me. Number one. Number one, he wants us to forgive from the heart. If you didn't catch that earlier, boy, you better catch it now. Like, don't water this down. Jesus doesn't. He does just the opposite. He amplifies the intensity of it by saying the type of forgiveness he is looking for from us is forgiveness from the heart. So you know what that means? I forgive you isn't enough. I forgive you. Not going to do it. God wants me to forgive you, so I forgive you. That's not what he's looking for. The type of forgiveness he is looking for is the type of forgiveness that comes from the inside out. I want to forgive you, so I forgive you. That there is a desire inside of us that drives us to forgive those who have wronged us. That is impossible apart from the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us as we know Christ Jesus as our Lord. This is not something that we can fake. We can fake here. We can't fake here. That was the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, it's not about what you're doing out here. It's about what's happening inside here. And it's the same thing with the forgiveness that he's asking for. So don't water it down and think that I forgive you is enough. It's just the opposite. He wants this to be something that is so real to us that we have been so changed that it comes from the inside out forgiveness to those who have wronged us. So get that first. But then second, and this is so vitally important, and it might seem like a small difference, but it's not. It's huge. Second thing I would point out is the king offered the forgiveness totally and completely freely. Here's what I mean by that. Let me tell you what the king did not say to this servant. Here's what you need to do. Leave here, find everybody who owes you something, and you forgive them their debt. And after you've forgiven enough debts, you come back here, and I'll forgive your debt. It's a huge difference that sometimes we miss. What does he do? He forgives the debt completely and totally and freely but he expects that what he does for him will so change him from the inside out that when he sees his fellow servants, that he will also forgive. And when it does not happen, then he says, okay, there's something you've missed and you no longer have my forgiveness, which should totally terrify us. 
but also should help us to see that God does not say to us, forgive enough people, do enough things, come back and I'll forgive you. He offers it totally, completely, and freely, but he expects it to make a difference in their lives. And when it doesn't, he says, well, I guess you weren't plugged into the vine after all, because there ain't any fruit. It's a big deal. Third thing I notice. This guy's issue was not that he overestimated what was owed him. Right? It says he leaves there and he finds this other servant that in the New Living Translation, it says owed him a couple thousand dollars. A few thousand dollars. A better estimate in my mind is somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars. Don't you love it when the pastor corrects the Bible? That's what I'm going to do here. I believe it's more like five to ten thousand dollars. I prefer to settle accounts quickly. About a week ago, I borrowed five bucks from one person and 10 bucks from another. I needed $15, and I needed to do it quick, so I hit two people up, one for five, one for 10, borrowed it. Full intention was, the next day on the way in, I would stop at the ATM, pull 20 bucks out, pay them back. Next day, totally forgot. So I went in, and of course you remember when you can't do anything about it. Have you noticed that? Everything that you were supposed to do, you don't remember it when you can actually make a difference. Like I didn't remember it as I was driving right by the bank. It's not until I'm at work and I could pay these people. I won't tell you which of my um, uh, coworkers I owed 15 bucks to, but I owed, and I couldn't do anything. Like I couldn't pay them off because I didn't have the money in my pocket. And that happened day after day after day. For a week, I owed these people 15 bucks. And it bothered me. But only when I couldn't do anything about it. You know what I'm saying? For a week, this thing is eating at me. And so I did what any good husband would do. I went into my wife's purse, took out her wallet, and pulled 20 bucks out at home. This really happened. It's what I call my ATM, and uh, pulled that 20 bucks out of her wallet, brought it in, got change, gave $10 to one, $5 to the other, and $5 to me. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how that's supposed to work. I'm pretty sure that was in our vows somewhere. And so, I'm good paying everybody back but my wife. Like, that, it's a totally different relationship. I'm pretty sure that's biblical. Okay, so, um, so I still haven't paid her back. <laughs> But I paid them back, and it was just like, because oh. I prefer to settle accounts quickly. I've never borrowed from a person this kind of moolah, five to ten thousand dollars. But if I did, I can guarantee you I would want to pay them back. And if any of you somewhere in there, I forgot that you owed me five to ten grand. We should probably settle that up, okay? So, like, just send me an email and say, hey, I got your five grand. We'll just move forward like it never happened. No big deal. But I would want, if somebody I lent five to ten grand to, I would really want them to pay me back, too. Five to ten grand is not something to just kind of go, five to ten grand. I mean, if it is to you, feel free to give me five to ten grand. If it's no big deal, just go ahead and hand it over. The problem isn't that he overestimated what was owed him. The problem was he did not compare that to what he owed, right? Because five to ten grand sounds like an awful lot until you compare it to trillions of dollars. Then it's a pittance. Like that's hardly anything compared to trillions. And this is hugely important for us to understand because quite honestly, we wound each other a lot. Like we're really good at that. We are constantly wounding one another. Little words dropped, slights made, subtle, unintended insults and the like. I mean, like, we are constantly hitting each other and hurting one another. Our words cut far more than we might imagine on a daily basis, right? That sort of stuff happens all the time. But let's step back from those kind of hurts and let's talk about the bigger ones. Just as the pastor of praise, the ones that I'm aware of in this church the heart's broken. The promise is broken. The pain caused you. Just the ones that I'm aware of are too heavy for me to carry. 
And let me be clear that, like, I don't want to minimize those things. That's not the point. And I need to walk into this with humility because even just the other day, I was chatting with somebody who had been deeply, deeply wounded, deeply hurt. And this person was like, I'm not sure I can forgive them right now. And I said, that's not the phase that you're in. Like, you're not there right now. You need to start by grieving your loss. Start there and focus on that. There will come a time for forgiveness, but it's not right now. You need to start by grieving. And there are times. And, and so this is not like a full kind of picture of what forgiveness needs to look like. Any discussion about real forgiveness would be, need to be much more well-rounded. It would need to be a whole series on its own. Let me be really clear about that. But what this is about is how our unforgiveness of other people can keep us from receiving his forgiveness to us. And the type of forgiveness that he wants from us is that forgiveness that's from the heart. And our problem is when we try to forgive people, we're trying to decide which train we want to get on after it's already arrived at the next station. If you're just trying to, "Mm, I'm going to forgive that person, you are not doing it properly. Here's instead what you should do. This is huge if you want to forgive from the heart. This is massive in understanding how God would have us pastor our own hearts and lead our own hearts. Hear this. You want to forgive somebody from the hearts. Stop thinking about how you need to forgive them from your heart. Instead, start thinking about how much God has forgiven you for Take some time and pay attention to the depths of his forgiveness. Understand and over and over and over and over again, say, God, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Start there. Don't even think about that. Take it for a moment, put it on a shelf, and focus on his forgiveness of you. And that will so change your heart that the result will be the fruit of forgiveness for other people. That's what it looks like to forgive from the heart. This guy's problem was not that he overestimated how much was owed him, but that he underestimated how much he owed. How do you say to the king, Give me a week and I'll pay you back those trillions. He does not get how much he owes. And this is why this can, unforgiveness here can be something where it can keep us from receiving his forgiveness of us. Because I believe, I am convinced, you cannot know your Savior until you know how much you need a Savior. Let me say that again. You cannot know your Savior until you know how much you need a Savior. So if you don't understand the depths of your sin, if you don't understand how much he has forgiven you for, are you really even plugged into him? Because if you don't get the depths of your sin and what you deserve, the comeuppance that we really, truly deserve, how can we know what he has forgiven us for and really know him as our Savior? It's not possible. So in other words, we're not plugged into the vine that we're supposed to be pulling from in order to produce this sort of fruit. We've gotten it wrong somewhere. This guy's issue was that he walks in and says, give me a week. Pled for mercy, but said, give me a week. Instead of understanding there was no way he was ever going to pay 164,000 years worth of debt. He didn't get how big his debt was. And so it didn't produce in him what it should have produced. This sort of thing is only possible as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Understanding the depths of our sin is essential for salvation. Essential for salvation. And it should 
fundamentally change us from the inside out. This last week, I was, or two weeks ago, I suppose, I was reading in the news leader about an accident. Caught my attention because I, as I was reading the article, one of our members was mentioned in it. I thought, that can't be her. But it was. Becky Hutchings. So apparently there were two guys who were breaking into cars. Someone saw them. And uh, called the police. And so the police... um, headed out and saw them, flipped on their lights. So they jumped in a truck and took off. Police officer recognized that this is a chaotic situation, incredible amount of danger, and flipped the lights back off. Um, Just to kind of de, you know, intensify, whatever you call it, the situation, de-escalate the situation. But it was too late. Plowed through an intersection, slammed into a car with a lady named Beth in it. And killed her. When they hit the car, it pushed it right into Becky's front yard. And so Becky went out and prayed with her, prayed over her as she died. Beth was on her way to church to serve when she was killed by two people who were just doing dumb things. Their pastor afterwards was interviewed for this article and said, her death is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. I think I know Ray and Beth's heart well enough to know that these men who were involved in that, what they would want more than anything is for them to know that the Lord loves them and he died for those sins. And he would offer them forgiveness as I know Ray and Beth would. And so I hope even in this moment that there are people who will hear that it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus loves you. How does that happen? How does that happen? Apart from the supernatural working of God in this person's life. How does that happen but that they are aware of the incredible debt that they owed that was forgiven. And for you and for me, like, I think there's a few things we should take away from this story. One, if you find yourself regularly saying to God, God, just be patient with me. I'll get my life straightened out. God, be patient with me. I'll get this fixed and then we'll be good. You are plugged into the wrong vine. That's not Jesus. That's not salvation. That's not Christianity. That is something else. And Jesus would say to you, your problem is you do not understand the depths of the debt that you owe and what you deserve as a result. Half measures are not good enough. What you deserve is far worse than you imagine. And until you grasp the depths of what you owe, you will never be plugged in to me. First thing I would say. And to those people, I would say, you cannot pay that debt off. It's not just patience. And you get it fixed in a week. Next week I'll do better, God. And then you'll accept me. That's not the gospel. That's not the good news. That's something else. And we have people who would love to talk with you about this. Just take the time to text the name Jesus to the number 417-222-2800. 417-222-2800. Just text the name Jesus to that number and they would love to talk with you about what the gospel really looks like and what it means for you and the depths of the debt that is truly owed 
and walk you through that. So don't miss that.